Hello, everybody. Welcome to class number four of our uh, cross stitch crafting for the holidays series. For some reason, I always want to say those words out of order. I'm so, so glad that you are here today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for, you know, those of you who are in the chat. I, I see some uh, in the gallery view on Zoom, some familiar faces and familiar names. So uh, thanks for those of you who've uh, attended this whole time. It's just fun to, <laughs> fun to see familiar faces. I'm going to jump right in today. Uh, and I want you all to know I have a big thing of some nice warm tea with rose hips in it. Um, so that hopefully I won't have like a cough attack like I did last week. My gosh, we are in prevention mode this time. So today's class, we are talking about making a custom greeting card. And like the previous classes, this is going to be all about options for you for what to do with your cross stitch projects that you've made, uh, fun ideas. The first week we did a snowflake motif uh, in a embroidery hoop, a four inch embroidery hoop that we turned into an ornament that you can either hang on a holiday tree, Christmas tree, hang on your wall for the holidays, whatever you would like to do. Um, the second week we talked about making, I think that was custom gift tags. Yes, because last week was mason jar lids. So there are a lot of different things that you can do with your cross stitch projects to gift them away. That's more than just something in a frame. Uh, because when you have a, a craft or hobby, if you crochet, if you cross stitch, you know, you can only make so many scarves for people. You can only make so many blankets, cross stitch. You can only do so many patterns for people to hang on their walls. So hopefully this will give you some great ideas, not only how to integrate other elements of crafting and creativity in your work, but uh, you know, ideas of different types of cross stitch patterns you can uh, use or make or customize or design yourself to integrate into other ways of, of utilizing your cross stitch work and giving yourself an excuse to keep cross stitching in new and creative ways. So without further ado, let me switch to my stitching view here. And we're going to talk about making a custom greeting card. So I printed out today's um, syllabus and pattern. And we're just going to start uh, right off the bat with, unfortunately, I mean, this might be the little bit technical part, the little boring part. For those of you who have watched every single class, this might be a little bit repetitive. But for those of you who are new, I hope it's helpful. The first thing that I would say that you can think about um, as far as making custom cross stitch projects for the holidays, especially if you're making the same thing multiple times, if you're making a greeting card that you're going to give to, say, immediate family members, and you're making two, four, six, eight, ten of the same thing, you want to consider how much time it's going to take to stitch such a thing. And you're going to want to think about what you can do to expedite that stitching. Because if you are like me, there are times where you have planned, planned, planned all these great big projects, and then it turns out they are bigger and more time consuming than you could have imagined. And you wish that maybe you didn't bite off more than you could chew. So the first step to thinking about what you're going to do for your cross stitch holiday projects is a little bit of math. Uh, there are a few things you can do to cut down on stitching time and to be able to pump out more if you have a lot of gifts to make. Uh, this is utilizing smaller motifs. So this, for example, is just a, a, a cute person. This is a stitch person. That's our company is Stitch People. For those of you who don't know, we do uh, cross stitch people and cross stitch family portrait patterns, lots of mix and match, teaching you how to make your own people portraits and family portraits and all that. So for this particular example, we just did you know a, a basic font here for a happy Christmas and a uh, custom little person in a kind of a ugly Christmas sweater kind of vibe with a funky, you know, ugly Christmas hat, just like a quirky little Christmas person. So this could be personalized uh, as you, you know, that you're saying happy Christmas, here's a card for someone, or this could be personalized for the person you're gifting it to. So it looks like them and they go, oh my gosh, that's me in an ugly sweater. Uh, there are a lot of different things you could do with this little person. Feel free as you're stitching it to change the hairstyle, change the hair color with different flosses you have on hand. Uh, we've got a lot of resources at stitchpeople.com about color recommendations for skin tones, hair colors, things like that. So just a heads up that you can get totally creative with this person here. The trick is, if you wanted to create a full family portrait, if you wanted to change up this text, you do want to think about the constraints of your final product. So we are working with recollections, cards and envelopes. Um, we've got a, a custom, custom card uh, product here that Michael sells. And what it is, is it comes with envelopes like this. 
Oh, Spencer's going to put a link in the chat. Oh, I should have introduced you. My husband Spencer is here. He's also my business partner and he's just off screen on his laptop monitoring the chat. So please feel free to ask loads of questions because he's going to be reading them as I blab away talking to you here on the camera and uh, he'll let me know, you know, all the all the pressing questions. So, hi Carla. Oh, oh gosh, I just bopped him in the nose. <laughs> that was frightening. I didn't know you were there. I'm so sorry. Um, so in, in Recollections uh, custom greeting cards packet here, it comes with 10 of these. You've, get, you've got 10 envelopes that are really sturdy, really great, just your typical envelope. And then you've got 10 greeting cards. And essentially what it is, is a built-in frame, as you can see, that's just open. And then it opens up to a greeting card. Now, if I were making these for my family, for my friends, whatever, what I would probably do is, as you can see, this is a little bit dark. Uh, pencil clearly won't show up. A Sharpie probably would, but I might suggest getting like a cute, uh, you know, check out scrapbooking supplies at Michael's and get a nice, you know, Christmas card stock of some kind, cut out a nice little insert and maybe use some glue dots and write your message on that. It would pop. It'll give it one more layer of customization. Just a little pro tip. All of you scrapbookers are like, please, we're 10 steps ahead of you. But, uh, but that's probably what I would do just to give it a little bit uh, of a polished look. Um, but as far as preparing your cross-stitch project for this, it's always a good place to start by understanding how much room you have. So we have essentially here, and it does show on the packaging your dimensions, but I like to measure just to make sure it's like have you ever done any construction and I, I think it's like a two by four it's not really this full, like a full two inches by a full four inches and if you don't know that going in it's very disappointing it's not it's like a quarter of an inch it's not it's a whole thing so similarly always measure make sure you know what you're working with so we have a card here where the card itself is about seven inches wide but you can even see if I'm holding my I mean, it's it kind of depends where on the edges here I'm looking. So I, I mean that truly, it's about seven inches wide. Then it's about five inches high, but you can see my measuring uh, line here. Eh, the five line is just over. So it's maybe just under five inches. So again, you just want to double check and know what you're working with. That said, this is going to speak to maybe how big you need to cut your fabric at the end when you're getting ready to actually frame it. What you need to understand and, and make sure that it's clear is that the only thing that's visible, right, is inside the frame. So as far as how much stitching you have to do to fill this space, you want to um, measure the frameable area, which, as you can see, is ooh, five and three quarters inches wide by three and three quarters uh, inches tall. So it's you know, roughly a four by six area. And I, I rounded up for measuring purposes just for the sake of discussion here today, but really we're working with three and a half by five and a half space. Now, what does that mean as far as your cross stitching is concerned? Well, that's going to affect the pattern that you choose. So this pattern is 34 squares tall or high by 44 squares wide. I just counted ahead of time. So we're looking at a 34 by 44 motif here just broke my pencil, which means we need to pick an Ada fabric, uh, the fabric that you cross stitch on, for those of you who are new to cross stitching, we need to pick the size Ada fabric that's going to best suit our needs. So the most common sizes are size 11, 14, and 18. For those who are new, size 11, uh, the, the size number, meaning the, the number 11, 14, or 18, indicates the number of squares in the weave of the Ada fabric and or the number of cross stitches that fit perfectly onto those squares that fit in an inch. So size 11 Ada fabric is gonna be the biggest of these options because there's only 11 stitches fitting within an inch versus size 18 Ada fabric is squishing 18. Uh, I guess I should be gesturing here. So size 11 fits these biggest squares because you're fitting more into an inch or fewer into an inch. When you fit more into an inch, they have to be a little smaller. So it's a smaller weave of fabric, meaning that for size 11 Ada fabric, on a size four by six uh, area, like I said, I rounded up for easier math. We have a 44 by 66 squares area to fill with our motif uh, versus a size 18 fabric. We have 72 squares by 108 squares. So you have quite a lot more space to fill. And if you use this smaller fabric, 
your motif not only will look smaller, but you'll have a lot more white space potentially around the edges, which you may feel inclined to fill with a border, with florals, with a whole bunch of stuff that's going to take more time. So if you're only making one of these, go for it, fill it up. Um, I'm not saying more is bad. Um, it's just something to consider ahead of time, especially I just I really caution you, especially if you're doing multiple things at once, because I am an overachiever. I am a crafter's crafter and I have done this myself. I'm like, oh, I'll just make one for everybody. And I am up on Christmas Eve, just like stitch until my fingers bleed. So I don't want that for you. So just think ahead about the size fabric you're using and how it's going to affect the particular project size that you're working on, which is why with these smaller motifs filling, um, taking up a little less space, I, I want it to feel bigger. So I, I recommend for these projects a size 11 fabric because I have less space to fill. So that's just my first little tip and we'll move on. So all of you who watched the previous classes and we've talked about math, uh, <laughs> you know, we're done now uh, because here 44 by 66 with a 34 by 44 motif, I'm only gonna have, you know, 10-ish squares of Ada fabric on either side, which is just a nice white space border, not too, um, it's not gonna be too, too squished up to the edge in my frame here. Uh, it's gonna be just nice and nice and, uh, you know, lots of, lots of good, uh, what, yeah, white space is the word I'm looking for. Lots of nice padding, visual, visual padding. So, one other thing to consider is if you want to customize your pattern at all. So with our, with our book, and, and I truly just mean this as a resource, we have a lot of mix and match patterns for you already done, but I know a lot of you are highly creative and could probably look at this and, and figure it out yourself. So I, I just, as an aside, you know, our, our book gives you lots of options for swapping out the outfits. We have a ton of um, Christmas stuff too. You don't have to necessarily get the whole, uh, this is kind of our main book. We've got a Christmas mix and match. We've got nativity patterns if you wanted to do like a little angel or a, a you know a mary joseph baby jesus kind of a thing we have a hanukkah patterns where um especially with our latest book we just released holiday backgrounds and that's got like a whole bunch of nice like feasty looking tables where you can sit for um you know christmas meal hanukkah meal kwanzaa meal we have a bunch of different like you know menorah patterns and things that you could adorn and what that would require too is changing out the text so what I would recommend for this is just taking your time. If you're going to swap out happy for Mary, or you want to say Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or holidays instead of Christmas, what I would do is, again, just pause and take your time. You can develop your own font or alphabet, whatever you want to call it. And I do give you permission to do that hereby permissed. You have, I don't even know if that's a word, but I used it. I'm there it is. Uh, <laughs> you have permission to do what you need to do uh, and have fun with it. If you really like your handwriting, for example, you, if you have really good cursive, if you're a calligrapher, what I would recommend is printing out some graph paper and just do some calligraphy uh, around the size that you would want for your pattern. There's a lot of uh, grid paper programs online where you can say how many squares per inch you want the, the grid or graph to be. So you could do 11 squares per inch, just like the 11 size Ada fabric. And if you write a, on top of that, it'll give you a general idea of how to kind of turn that into your own scripty um, font or alphabet. Stitch people, we also have a whole bunch um, in our book and, and for you know really inexpensive downloads online, but this is kind of the format of what they look like. So even still, what you're gonna have to do, let's say you know, you find a font on Stitch People that you like, or you find a font on Etsy. There's a lot of great embroidery and cross-stitch fonts. What you're going to get is something like this, where it's just the alphabet. So you're still going to have to work it out. So what I would recommend is using your, your graph paper. Uh, let's say we wanted to say holidays instead of Christmas. So it, it's a little arduous, but it works. So here's our H, and you just take it on your graph paper, and you trace exactly what what the pattern shows. And it, it'll just take a minute. You just figure, figure out the font. And I'm not gonna go through and do the whole thing and I've done a terrible job um, transferring it. But if you're really careful, you could also use a uh, transfer paper like that tracing paper and trace it over top and cut that out and like move your letters all around, get the spacing just right. Um, but that's essentially what you're, what you're doing in that planning process is working on getting the spacing just right. I generally recommend for most, for most fonts or scripts or alphabets, whatever you're calling them, uh, 
it's usually good just one square of space in between each letter. With a cursive one, you might want to think about bumping them up together so it looks like it flows one letter into the next like cursive is want to do. So it's just something to keep in mind. And I wish I had more tips and tricks for you, but it's just sort of a trial and error, piece it together, mix and matchy kind of process. A few, a few tips I would give is, as you can see, even just in my quick uh, tracing of a HO, looking for the word holidays, the baseline of my H is here and the baseline of my O is up here. So before you begin, I would definitely like take a straight edge of some kind and trace your baseline. So it's, that'll save you a little time, a little less guesswork to just make sure that you're getting it where it needs to go. Um, then what you need to do when you're done with your new word, you'll count it out, see how big it is, see where it's gonna belong on your pattern, what's the width, where do you want it in relation to the person? It's just a little bit of, of sc scooching. You know what I mean? A little measuring, a little planning, a little scooching around. I just wanna encourage you to give it a shot. Don't be intimidated by it. It's just a graph. And at the end of the day, you can start over. It's totally fine. So it's just a matter of centering it or giving it you know, some sort of cool spacing that you like, that appeals to you. And at the end of the day, a couple tricks. If you feel that if you've, if you've planned it and you've stitched it and it looks like it's too high, oh, hey, guess what you can do? You can stitch a couple little underlines, just some straight stitches, and it'll look like you know you meant to put it where you did to fill that space below with the underlines. You could fill, you, you you could stitch a little you know Christmas tree or you know some sort of little something to fill out the space if you wanted to fill it out more. If you put it on your fabric, if you stitch it and it doesn't look right and you have empty space to fill feel free to fill it with something. It's okay. It's okay to make mistakes because also the person receiving this card doesn't know it was a mistake, right? They don't know what you were planning. They just know what they see. So apologize for nothing. Have fun. Find some graph paper, print out whatever size you need and, uh, and have fun with this process because I think it's a really fun thing to be able to customize them. Family names, special messages, whatever you'd like. So for this particular example, I'm going to set my book aside here. We have stitched to the pattern just as is. We have happy Christmas. So now we're going to move into the phase of how do we get it? We, you know, we talked about getting our pattern just right. We have now fast forwarded like a cooking show to having our pattern all stitched here. How do we get it into the frame is kind of the big next thing. Actually, I'm, I'm a step ahead of myself and I apologize for that. Um, I want to talk about making this ugly sweater and funky hat pattern a little more fun because in our past three classes, we've talked a little bit about stitching techniques and I didn't want that to be lost on this class. I hadn't planned for it, but as I was thinking ahead for today, I thought of a fun little bonus thing that we could talk about. So, um, you know, class one, we talked about working with DMC light effects floss, which can be a little bit um, tricky to use. It's stiff, it's metallic. Uh, class two, we talked about using the, uh, Class two was the Boolean stitch for little curls in the caroler's hair. And last week we talked about perfecting the French knot, which there's a lot in this hat. So what can we do to make a little ugly sweater vibe even more fun? I was thinking pom-poms. Uh, what? Because a lot of pom-poms are on actual, like those kitschy, fun Christmas sweaters, which to be fair, some are unfortunate in their design and some are just really cozy and fun. And I don't fault anyone who wears them because they're the best. So bad news, blue Spence. I don't know where my needles are. So <laughs> that is bad news. I had to, <laughs> I had to everybody and they are no longer on my desk. So everybody coming over to my house, watch your feet, watch them good. Oh, that's a little needle. I need a bigger needle. There we go. So I have a new needle. Oh, be careful. Careful. That Does that happen to anybody else? It happens to me more than I'd like to admit. I'll be honest. So what I would like to suggest is playing with extra materials. You can bring pom-poms into this. You can bring ribbon into this. You can bring all sorts of sequins, beads, anything that you would actually find on an ugly sweater, you can totally add onto your motif here. Um, if you had tiny beads, oh my gosh, that needle just flew out of my hand and now I don't know where that one is. You can't make this stuff up, folks. I tell you what, fourth, fourth needle's the charm. Here we go. Who knew you could lose so many needles just sitting in one place? Don't judge me by my disorganized bobbin bin. 
I can't prioritize that right now. Um, so what I would like to do is sew this little pom-pom right at the top of my hat, just to give it a little poof, because I think that is funny and fun. You could sew beads into this little bow. You could come up with your own ugly sweater motif. I believe we have a free pattern for ugly sweaters. So Spencer's going to find it, put it a link. It is totally free. You just uh, stitch people.com slash whatever the website is that he's going to put in the chat. And we have a whole bunch of different ugly sweater motifs that you could swap out. Um, so just have fun with it, get funny with it, get creative with it. So what I'm going to do is just grab a length of yellow floss because we already had that as part of this, part of this uh, bundle here of flosses for this particular project. And I'm going to just use, I'm going to use two because I don't want it to be too thick in the pom-pom because I'm going to jab my needle through that pom-pom, but I do want it to be, so not so thick that I have a hard time getting it through, but I want it thick enough that it's nice and strong. So what I'm going to do is I, the way I cross stitch is with no knots and that's what I'm used to. So that's how I'm going to start this. So I just leave a tail hanging. I don't make any knots in the bottom. And what I like to do is what I call pre-secure the floss. So when I've got, when I'm doing details like this with embroidery or attaching anything like a pom-pom, I'll just run my, uh, my newly threaded needle and floss through the back of some of the exi existing stitching on the back side and pre-secure it. So I've got a little loop. I'm just gonna like make a tiny little catch there and run it through a couple times so that it's nice and secure. And see, I can pull that and it's not going anywhere. So now I'm gonna poke my needle just through, uh, through the middle top of this tree. And I know I'm covering up that cute little star motif. And I just need my floss available to kind of poke through this pom-pom. And I could poke straight through and go back down, but then I'd see my floss at the top of the pom-pom. So what I'm actually gonna do is think, think less of coming up to the top and back down straight through and think of coming kind of through the side, like through the right side and through and down into the left side, almost like you use a safety pin or when you're pinning fabric together. So now I'm gonna come through the side. You just poke right through and I'm, oops, I pulled my needle off, but I'm gonna thread that through and get it nice and tight to my uh, fabric. Rethread my needle because I was irresponsible and pulled that right through. And then now that that's on there, good and tight. Uh oh, see, I pulled too tight. You got to be careful, pom poms. It's going to pull right off because I pulled it too tight. So I'm going to try again. It's just a bunch of fuzz, really. So you can, you can um, pull through it. I actually don't know how pom-poms are made, but I do know you can pull through it. So we'll try again, a little more gently. I won't pull so, so aggressively. And I'm gonna stick my needle back down through the center and pull. And just again, a little patience goes a long way as this uh, pulls into place. Ta-da, we've got a little pom-pom. How cute is that? And now it's a little bit of a 3D element and I can just run my, Needle through the back side a couple of times to secure my floss. Clip it off. And we got an even sillier ugly sweater motif. So I just wanted to offer that as a little example of ways you can get super creative with these projects, especially something as silly as an ugly sweater motif. Once you have this in the, uh, in the frame, you could plan ahead to secure pom-poms like in the corners, right? I don't have two more matching ones, but I pull them out. And these are just like crafting supplies, pom-poms that you could, you can get at Michael's. Um, link, in the chat. link in the chat. So now I had gotten ahead of myself before. We now learned our little bonus pom-pom technique. Now we need to gulp, cut the fabric and get it to size. This is where back to those construction analogies, you measure twice, or a hundred times <laughs> and you cut once. Now you wanna remember what we measured before. This was about seven inches by about five inches. Our open space here is about uh, three and a half inches by um, five and a half inches. So what I did ahead of time is I went ahead and I used my card to trace 
around uh, my motif to center it. I, I adjusted left to right like this, and it was just a little bit of trial and error where I could see the edges of my motif here are you know, the edge of the woman, the edge of the lettering. And I just held this over and I kind of counted if this was the same, if this was the same, depending on where it was, I shifted it over one or two, made some little hash marks, and then was able to just follow the line of the Ada fabric to make that uh, full border. And then I did the same thing, you know, top, top to bottom of the tallest and, um, sorry, the, yeah, the highest and lowest point of my motif. I held this up and just counted, 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 counted. And I did that ahead of time just because that it took a minute just to get it just right. Um, you could also literally measure it however it makes sense to you to get a nice border around which to cut. This said, I will keep in mind that because I use the full card, it's going to be <laughs> right up to the edges, first of all. And my visible area is only going to be the smaller area. So I, I am anticipating that once I cut it to size of the card, I am going to need to trim it down ever so slightly um, just so it fits within the edges of the card and doesn't stick out here and doesn't bubble in this uh, boundary. So I'm going to go ahead and cut my fabric. I ironed this already after coming out of the embroidery hoop. It leaves a nice edge. And what I mean by that, I believe I have a, um, yes, I was working with this floral motif yesterday. What I mean by the edge, if you've never stitched before, when you take something out of its embroidery hoop, it leaves a nice crease. So I've already ironed that out. What I like to do is put it on it um, upside down and just really focus on ironing the edge and not the work itself. So just a heads up about that. And I would test your iron on a corner of your fabric where it, there's no, no chance that it will be visible on your final work, just to make sure there's no rust. There's no like, you know, the minerals. And if you have a steam iron, the minerals in the water can like build up and discolor your fabric. So iron a little section <laughs> of your fabric that's not going to be visible before you iron the actual thing so that you don't leave any inadvertent stains or anything and try to avoid ironing your work directly because it'll squish the stitches, squishes them down, flattens them out, makes it a little lackluster. If you do uh, iron your work and it gets a little squishy, don't fear. Chances are you can fix it. Most things are fixable. Stains, I don't know. And that's why I suggest <laughs> ironing around the edge first. Uh, but if you squish your work by ironing it and flattening out the stitches, this is one of those examples where I like to use my needle as a tool. I don't just use my needle as a floss poker, right? If, if your work got really flattened out, it would be a little tedious, but what I might do is go through stitch by stitch and just kind of run my needle under and, and re-fluff those stitches, bring them, bring them up, bring them back to life. Uh, spending a few minutes doing that um, will help. <laughs> Why do I know that? Because I've done it. So never fear. Now we want to test putting this in our frame. Let's see how good it goes. It slid right in there. Oh my heck, perfect, perfect. And does it slide all the way over without being seen? Aha, I have a little bit of an edge sticking through. Cause again, this, the measurements of this card aren't perfect. And I'm also double checking that this isn't bubbling. If I had more fabric than the frame allowed for, it would be kind of puckering like, like that. It is not doing that miraculously. So what I'm just gonna do is because I liked the centering there when it was all the way down. I'm just gonna cut off two little rows, barely anything at all. You can always cut more. So when you're making a little adjustment like this, like, ooh, I need to cut off just a little bit off the side because it was peeking through, start really small because you, you might have to cut four times, tiny little slices, but better that than cutting too much at once and having to start over. So now when I stick that through, oh, fits like a charm. Happy Christmas. There you go. Now, what you could do is just, um, you could glue the edge shut to keep it in place. You could just leave it open if you like. I kind of like the idea of gluing it down because it, it helps give this a little bit more of a finished look because this side is glued down, just that's how it's produced. So that's nice and tightly closed. And then this is kind of, floppy and open. And, and I don't love that. I don't love the shadow it creates here on the work. So I would glue that. You could also try, I've pre-cut 
just some crafting felt, which again, you can get at Michael's. And what you could do is back, use this as a backing and either just lay it. The uh, texture of the felt is kind of sticky like Velcro. So you could just lay it right on there and it, it will kind of stay in place. You could also just gently tack stitch the corners or along the edge, however you want to do that. But if you wanted to give it just a little bit more padding, for lack of a better word, sort of like batting in a quilt, uh, like you, you don't need batting, but it sure makes it squishy and luxurious. You could do that as well. And scooch this into your frame. And then when I glue the edge down ever so, it's going to fill out the space even better. It, it, the felt behind the finished Ada cross stitch work gives it a little bit of rise such that it, it helps the Ada fabric sit closer to the edge of the greeting card and, and fills that gap that we talked about earlier. So that's how I would do it. You don't have to, it's just an extra step for a little extra finish. And then what I would do is take glue. You could probably use a glue gun. Uh, I would probably suggest a stronger paper glue. I love this E6000 crafting glue. It's like super glue. It does it seems to do everything. I'm not sure if it's made specifically for paper. I'd probably test it on some paper first, but get your strongest, most favorite paper glue. And you'd want to just do barely, barely, barely along the edge, try and avoid the fabric just in case there's any sort of bleeding onto the fabric. You don't want that leaching on. And I would just seal that right in. Alternately, if you wanted a little bit less of a rustic feel for your card, because this is just like brown craft paper. Like I mentioned, when you open it, you could do some scrapbooking skills and just cut some nice paper to size, fill this in, have a nice big area to write on. You could put a family photo in here, whatever you want to do. Or if you're into washi tape, which is available at craft stores near you at Michael's online, all that, I think we have a link for it. Link coming, in. link coming in hot to the chat. Washi tape is the perfect width for these little frames. How fab is that? So I ripped the edge here. What I'm going to do is just make sure I cut it nice and straight. So if you wanted to really bling your, um, bling up <laughs> your frame here, this could be a way that you sort of help keep it closed as well. So what I would do is I'm gonna just lay this on like this, get it nice and straight. This is not the strongest tape. I don't know what brand this one is specifically. This is just some that I had around, but I know there's a ton of different types you can get. And that was not great. And now I have some craft paper on here. So I'm going to cut myself a new length so I can get it just right. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do that off, off the roll and just line it up real straight. And I get real quiet when I'm doing precision work. Like surgical over here. Okay. So you just lay it on there. What I might do, because like I mentioned, if I was making this into a real card that I was giving someone, which is ostensibly the plan here, <clears throat> I probably would cut out some nice Christmas card stock to, to fill these pages that it's a, light, a lighter color that I could write on. So I wouldn't mind wrapping my tape like this as a way to help close this edge up because I'm gonna be covering this anyway. Tricky, tricky, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Aha, I won't cough again. I've been working with a voice doctor hardly incidentally. And what happens when you cough while you're giving something like a long presentation or giving a class is because as you speak, wind comes through your vocal cords. And if you're just talk, talk, talking, they rarely get a chance to just like sit, sit and rehydrate because the air is dehydrating them, which I thought that was very interesting. It's like when you hear it, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But I never really thought about it before. Just, just wind drying out the cords. Here we go. I'm gonna bring this over as well. 
bring this over. And then top to bottom, since I don't really have, I, I could fold it over the top here, but I can't fold it over the back side because it folds. So I'm going to make a really precise cut in the tape. Nice straight edge. Track my, my trash. I get my straight edge here, line it on up with the top. Make sure it's a straight, straight uh, alignment. Spence, you were going to talk. Do we have a question? Well, I was going to say, for those of you in the chat, uh, there's a great question. Ko just put a question in the chat about uh, like magnification while you're stitching to help you see the stitches and stuff like that. So for those of you who use uh, magnification tools, uh, let's give Ko some tips in the chat. Yeah. I will also recommend, I'm not affiliated with this brand really. Um, once they, they gave us a thing for a, a giveaway uh, because I had spoken highly of them just on my own already. Uh, Ott Light, O-T-T. I think, I think craft stores carry them generally, Michaels. I, I'm so used to, um, I'm generally agnostic when I'm doing stitch people stuff. So yeah, Michaels I'm sure has plenty of options. They do Ott Light. Yeah. Okay, good. Michael sells alt lights and do keep an eye on them because alt lights are, uh, their whole brand is kind of to solve this problem. And it also solves another problem. So because it's lights, so their biggest uh, sell, I guess their biggest problem they're solving is that they provide really bright uh, daylight lamps. So what that helps you with is when you're stitching at night and you have a really bright alt light, uh, the light, the quality of the light is going to match what you get during the day. Cause sometimes it's hard to differentiate colors of floss at night because iridescent bulbs are kind of yellow, or if you have LEDs that are kind of, kind of blue or kind of yellow, the alt light really seeks to make a, a nice daylight so that when you're stitching during the day, you've got light coming through your windows, it's going to be very similar. And so you're not going to make any color related mistakes, hopefully. Um, you know what I'm going to do? Aha, if you're doing the tape method, watch this. Cause again, I'm planning on covering that side up. So what I can do is use this tape to close my edge up like this. And then I'll just cover it twice on the front side. Oh, it's kind of hard to see this little 2D scenario. We'll fold that over, tape it shut. Anyway, Altlight also has some that have magnification properties. So it'll have like a big magnifying glass attached to it, something like that. Okay, so now I've closed that edge with the same tape. And then when I tape it, it'll just blend right in. And now when the wise, uh, here we go. That is the reason I said that in a British accent is <laughs> that's a line from A Christmas Carol. <laughs> That I've done now at least a dozen times. As I, like like Spencer mentioned, we met doing theater. I don't know if he mentioned that live. We talked to the host of the class beforehand about it. We met doing theater, uh, and it was a production of A Christmas Carol. That's one of our favorite shows to do. And in the scene where the laundress and the charwoman and the undertaker have gone through Scrooge's house and stolen all his things, um, yeah, that's one of the lines. No one's the wise. No. So we now have totally blinged out our Christmas card. And I think it, <laughs> it looks really fun. And especially if you had more of these pom-poms and it was just like a sparkle glitter Christmas mess. I think that would be so funny. I love a funny, I'm, I'm all for a joke. So that's sort of the angle that I would take here. That said, depending on what your motif here is, like this, this polka dot gold could be like really elegant and fun. If it was, we have a, a series of patterns for, for Christmas Carol. So if you did like a big elegant Victorian tree and like somebody in a nice hoop dress and you know, uh, Spencer would play um, Scrooge's nephew, Fred, and I'd play Fred's wife. And there's a big party scene where they play yes and no and Scrooge is playing and, and they, you know, that whole thing. So we could do little Spencer as Fred and me as Fred's wife and a very elegant thing and a more elegant washi tape. Like you could really make this your own uh, and not take it as, as a funny approach. But I just think, I just think that's great. So now I'm gonna double check our syllabus, make sure we are on track. 
All righty, we have done text planning, we have done cross stitch patterns, we have framed it in our card and it's not going anywhere. Once again, I would cut out um, a piece of nice paper and I would just use glue dots to sort of tack it on here and it would sit right up against the edge, real nice so you wouldn't see where I folded all this over. And last but not least, I wanna give you some photography tips because Here's a hypothetical that I know myself well enough to know that this just might happen to me. Let me take a sip of this before it's too late. I would imagine, and I'm gonna to switch to my camera view here so you can see me explain. I would imagine that you're like, wow, I've got this great 10 pack of recollections, personalifying greeting cards. <laughs> I'm making up words left and right here. Thank you for your patience. Uh, customizable greeting cards is the official word. Uh, this is great. I'm going to make 10 cross stitch cards for my very, very best friends or family members. I'm going to do it. Okay. And then it gets to be Thanksgiving and now you're planning dinner and you're making a spread and now it's early December. Oh my gosh, I have to get Christmas presents for everybody. So you're shopping and you're wrapping and you're mailing. And all of a sudden it is December 15th and then it's December 20th and you've only made like one of these. <laughs> I see that scenario as something that could definitely happen to me. So for any of you who are like me, I want to talk about recreating this uh, in photo form. We have a lot of people who are Stitch People customers who make cute Christmas style family portraits for themselves every year out of uh, Stitch People patterns. And I think we have one, I bet I have some in the back of this book. I just wanna show you what I mean because they get so, so cute. So um, let me go to my stitching. I know we've, aha, here's one. So this one is uh, Micah. She's one of the ones who does a Christmas um, pattern of her family every year. So then what a great, you can see, this is a great photo of it because I'm 99% sure that what she does is takes a photo of this and uses this as like the family uh, photo for their Christmas card that they send out every year. So if you wanted to do the same thing, you could split the difference with these customizable greeting cards and still do the washi tape and still do the fun scrapbook interior, but only have to make one kind of master cross stitch, which you then photograph beautifully, print it out in a five by seven and just fill the other cards with the pretty photo of your family, right? Of your family portrait, because that's going to save you time when it's December 15th and you've got to get these things in the stinking mail or else, right? So a few tips for photography. I just want to uh, demystify it a little bit for you because it can really make or break it. And this is also, if you are a crafter who's maybe trying to have a bit of a better social media presence, or you know, you're wanting to post on Instagram, anything like that. There's there are some tips and tricks that you can do to make your photography really effective of your crafting. So I'm going to clear my space a little bit because to be honest, that's step number one. Step number one is to just use a really solid and bright background to make a uh, to take a photo. And you can. Um, there are a few things you can do to cheat. So if this is the framing of my photo, there we go. This is the framing of my photo. If I'm taking it straight on like this, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have settings on your phone and I have Spencer's phone here to help me. This is like inception. When you, uh, when you tap on a phone generally, and here's the trick, you, you might get uh, to thinking that, oh, I need a really fancy camera. You don't. If you have a smartphone, you likely have a very, very good camera. They're very good. So first of all, you want to make sure to go into your settings, um, and I won't do that here, but open your phone settings, open like the camera app and make sure that all the settings are that you're getting, you know, the, the largest quality photos, highest pixels, anything that looks big. And I'm not gonna get in technical because you really don't have to. Anything that looks big, choose that. Um, it's usually listed in order from like biggest to smallest or smallest to biggest. Cause if you're taking a lot of photos on your phone, you might wanna store them small so that it doesn't take up a lot of storage space. You may have made that choice already. But if you're making a taking a photo to then reprint it, you wanna make sure you have the highest resolution possible. That's the most pixels. Um, every screen is made up of pixels and the more pixels you have, just like Ada fabric, like the math that we did here, the more squares you have, the tighter it is, right? The more detail you get. So just like Ada fabric, we want the most pixels possible. So then when you tap your screen, that usually gives you your focus point. And I don't know if, you, yeah, you see that little square showing up? 
that gives you a focus point. You'll also notice, and this is iPhones, but most smartphones are, are generally this way. There's a little sunshine that shows up. I'll do it over the pink so that you can see it better. Sorry. There's a little sunshine that shows up. That sunshine is about exposure and exposure has to do with the amount of light that comes in. So when you tap for focus, you can tap that, uh, that sunshine, come on, and drag it. If you drag it up, do you see how the screen got a little brighter? And if you drag it down, the screen gets a little darker, brighter, darker. So again, you, when, you, when you tap again, it will refocus and do auto exposure. But even if you feel like, you know, I'm looking at this screen and it's a little dark, if I drag that sunshine up, I get a little bit more light and that's, oh, that's what I like. Okay, great. Um, but, but when in doubt, just tap and you can take a photo. There are also settings and I probably should have looked at this ahead of time. There are also settings that you can make in your, um, in your, oh, you can do text, that's cool. There are ways that you can go into the camera settings and show a grid, and it will just so, sort of include grid lines here so that you can make sure that things are centered. Uh, a trick too is get a little creative. If, if you're doing a photo like this, say for Instagram, versus a photo like this where you want to just print the portrait, uh, give, do yourself a favor and purposefully put it on an angle. That way you it's not gonna look like you have to, you know, if, if I come close with the camera, you'll see how I can get really persnickety about like lining up that bottom edge of the camera with the bottom edge of my work. Um, and if it's a little bit off and you post a picture like that, it's going to look like, ooh, that person got really close to making it look straight. And then you don't, you don't want to waste time just like making it as straight as possible, right? That's so do yourself a favor and just give it a cute little angle. And that's just as great. I mean, that's, Hey, life hack, right? The other thing you can do, and, and I'm, I know I'm kind of going back and forth between if you want to do like a cute social media post, or if you want to do um, take a good photo for reprinting, there's something called a flat lay. That's the technical term. But if you felt like, uh, so first of all, I'm a big believer in just a color background. I think that would be a totally cute photo to post to Instagram. But if you feel like that is a little dull, what you could do is a flat lay. And what that means is, uh, a flat picture from above of a little scene, right? So this is you on Instagram and you're trying to say, hey, I'm so proud of myself. I made this great little, um, I made this great project, ta-da. Look at me go, look at me go. Now we have, oh cute, Spencer brought in last week's project. So you could say like, hey, look at me, I've been crafting like crazy. And now when I take my photo, as you can see, I've got some fun accessories that really sort of flesh out the story of what I've been up to. I've been using my embroidery scissors and my pom-poms and my, my little measuring thing. And I look at all the fun things I'm making. Now we have what's called a flat lay photo. Beep, we can take a photo of that, okay? So it's just thinking of what a bird's eye view would look like for your setup here. I'm just gonna check. Oh, we've got 10, 10 minutes, good. Because I wanna show you some editing tricks. So that was like a good Instagram photo. Now, I wanna to talk to you about, um, this is gonna be me taking a, I need to print this out and replicate it for my friends and family. Now, I don't know what setting it is. I know there is one. I thought it was just default. I must've turned it on on my camera. Because on my camera, I get a little crosshairs right in the middle of every photo that I take, such that it, it, it's, it's a white crosshairs like this little plus sign, white uh, and a yellow. And the white stays still and the yellow adjusts such that, again, smartphones are really good. As I tip my phone like this, the crosshairs adjust to where I can see that I'm perfectly lined up and straight because there's gonna be a slight difference. And I hope you can see this on the screen here there's gonna be a slight difference of perspective if you are flat, flat, flat taking this photo, which pretty much feels like that's what this is. So I'm gonna just take advantage and click versus if you take the photo like this, and, and I'm exaggerating for, for impact, but if you're not holding it straight, you see how the bottom is wider than at the top according to this screen, right? So it's gonna be really hard to replicate your family portrait and get it printed well if there's any sort of wobbliness 
because of the perspective of the camera. So you want to make sure that you're just real flat. And what I'm just doing is elbows on the table. Um, you could even lay the camera down, right? It's on the table. It's literally as flat as can be. Relax your hands and just lift right up and try and, and, and just imagine that you are as parallel as can be to that table. If you don't have those little hash marks that I mentioned. Okay. So now I'm going to show you some photo editing options. So what happens when this happens, which is a great place to start. You took a photo and what it's upside down. How do I fix that? Most smartphones have edit options built right in anything that has to do with flipping your photo or cropping it, making it shorter or taller. That's going to be this symbol here that looks like, I don't know, a couple of lines and some, some arrows. That's your crop tool. Up here, you can flip it around to get it just the right way. You could also flip it, you know, if for whatever reason you got it in a mirror <laughs> and you need a mirror view and the, the words don't line up, you can flip it all around using these options up here. And I know this is iPhone specific, but uh, honestly, most of these symbols are gonna be very similar um, from smartphone to smartphone. So, okay, great. Now we've got it, I'm gonna press done. We've got it laying the right way. Well, if I'm if I zoom in here, I have some shadows, really real shadows happening around the border here. I also feel like overall it's kind of dark, and I can see because of um, <laughs> I'll do something fun here where because I have this camera, I can show you what I see like in front of me. That's uh, oh, I guess I can't. Well, I can show you kind of there's like light coming in from different sources. I don't know if you can kind of see here, but if we're looking at this even. I've got light glaring in here. This is brighter. This is brighter. This is darker because there's light sources from the sides. And you can see that here in the photo. I don't love that. So if I go to edit, first of all, most cameras have an auto. I'm going to see what that does. Doesn't really change it the way I want to. So I definitely encourage you to go through each of the settings that it gives you. We talked about exposure, which has to do with the sun. And if you're if you're unsure what any of these settings do, my favorite thing to do, I, I used to be a professional photographer. I used to do weddings and stuff, lots of headshots for actors. If you're ever unsure what a setting does, just take it all the way to the extremes in both directions. And that'll show you really fast what it's affecting. You can always revert your photo, go back to the original. You, phones are built in a great way that you can't really mess it up. Um, so you take exposure all the way up you see what it's gonna do. You take exposure all the way down. Now I see the extremes, you know, and I can go a little bit up because I want a little more light, but I still get a lot of shadows. So if I go over here, what does brilliance do? All the way up? Oh, interesting. All the way down. This has something to do with words that come to mind are like crispiness. It's a little bit brighter. It's a little crispier. It's a little more even. So I'm gonna bump that ever so slightly. Highlights, what does that mean? Pro tip, it has to do with the highlights of your photo, the brightest areas. So if I go up, oh, it's messing with just the brights. It's either making the brights brighter or darker. So I don't know about that right now. Shadows, well, that's a word I need because what I'm not pleased with is the shadows here around my border. So shadows, if I take it all the way up or all the way down, making the shadows darker or lighter, I can really get a sense of what that does. And I do want to fill in the shadows. So I'm going to bring that quite a ways up. Contrast, what does that do for me? Oh, it makes, it makes the contrast between my darks and lights even more, or it evens out the difference between my darks and lights. So I don't, I don't know that I wanna play with that all that much. This is up to you, it's all personal preference. Brightness, overall, I know just because I've done this before that adding brightness is gonna help me, but you don't wanna go too much because it's gonna get washed out versus going not enough, it's gonna look too dark. So I'm gonna add a little bit of brightness. Black point, what's that? Same thing, just go all the way and you get a really good sense for what it does. What black point does, black point and contrast are similar, but contrast works on both the highs and lows in relation to each other versus black point just works on the lows. Then we have saturation and vibrance and they're related but different. Saturation is literally taking what colors are there and making them even more intense. If I up the saturation, my golds get real gold, my pink gets real pink. I generally don't do much with saturation. I do do a lot with vibrance. What vibrance does is, I, I couldn't tell you the technical of what it does. It, it's just more of a pop instead of an intensity. So I like, I like a saturation. Warmth might make it a little more yellow or a little more blue. 
So if you take something inside and you've got yellow incandescent bulbs and you need it to look a little more like daylight, you might decrease the warmth versus if you take something outside and your white Ada fabric looks a little blue because you're outside, you could up the warmth and make it look a little more even. I know I've only got a couple more minutes left, but I just want to go through all of these things that can really help you get to where you're going. If you have a photo you like, but it's a little fuzzy, you can up the sharpness and that'll really um, crisp up the edges for you. Then when you're done, you hit done, ta-da, we've got it. You can email it to yourself, airdrop it to yourself, uh, text it uh, to somebody, but you wanna make sure that it, the file size is gonna come through on a text. I don't recommend that if you're not used to it. And email is the best way to go. Email it to yourself, upload it to your uh, photo printing place of choice. If you've gone into the settings ahead of time and make sure that you've got all, you know, the highest quality, most pixels available, it's gonna be able to be printed at a Walgreens, at a Costco, at a wherever you like to print your photos. Um, that tool online will give you the crop that you need to be able to get just the right size, five by seven for your frame to reprint it, okay? So I just wanna kind of walk you through that process. Similarly, we could do this on our flat lay, do our, you know, our autos, not much. Usually what I do is I pop the exposure. I usually pop shadows. I'll just, this is my quick trips. I don't love a ton of contrast. So I usually actually reduce the contrast just a little. I usually uh, love to add a little brightness and then pop the vibrance. Usually I tend to like photos a little more warm than cool. That's just a personal preference. And this has been just enough edits that I think, you know, that would fit the aesthetic of my Instagram. Ta-da, we're done. So I just want you to, to not be intimidated by the, the options on your camera. This edit button is great. And look, like I said, you can't destroy it. On an iPhone, it has this revert option. You can just take it right back. Um, it also has some filters available that you can just swipe through and try. I generally wouldn't recommend that. It's You're going to get a better experience if you play with each of these settings one by one. You can also Google it, read about it, but, uh, but that's the way that you're going to get a nice evenly lit photo. Make sure it's perfectly straight from above such that when you send it off to a photo printer, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look just like it's, it does to your eye. Laying flat, you can put it right in the right in the frame and save yourself a little stitching time if you have waited too close to the last minute. So I think with our two minutes to go, that is it. So sad. Uh, that is it for our series on cross stitch crafting for the holidays. I'm going to just make, so look, I'm making like a little flat lay for you so that we have a nice, a nice, um, visual going out here. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining us for this four-part class. I hope today was helpful. I know a lot of the stuff we talked about in these classes was a little bit theoretical. Like I've mentioned before, it's, I just want to inspire you, try and give you ideas, try and empower you to, to, to tackle things that maybe you haven't done before, to not be as intimidated by maybe making your own letters or customizing your characters or playing with settings on your phone, because you can always revert and go back to the original and try again. Um, Everything, all the creative uh, creative tools are totally within your control. Um, so don't be intimidated. Jump right in. Give it a Google or ask us online. Send us an email, info at stitchpeople.com. We're always happy to help. Um, or on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash stitchpeople. We're always around. We're always happy to comment and help out. So without further ado, and as I say farewell, I'm just going to look over here at my monitor and make sure that I give you our reminders. So please be sure to post on social media, especially if you take a, a risk and make a new uh, kind of photo to post. If you play with your settings, let me know, let us know what you played with and hashtag it so that we can find you because that's hashtags aren't just like for salesy it helps if you can search things by hashtags and if you just post we won't be able to find you but if you post with hashtags we will and we'll be able to like it and see it so if you use the hashtag make it with michaels the hashtag dmc and hashtag stitch people then that's how we're going to be able to like pinpoint you on the internet and find your photo and give you a high five we want to see what you've made we want to see what you're up to we want to see your finished cards and see all the differences that you bring with your unique taste and flavor it's our favorite thing to just inspire creativity so give us those hashtags um please uh post to social media and 
uh, you'll be getting a survey about this class. So please fill that out. It helps us know what you liked, what you didn't like, what we can do better next time. And if you need to catch up on any of these classes or rewatch this one for any reason, Michaels will have that posted to their YouTube channel within 24 to 48 hours to search for Stitch People on the Michaels YouTube channel. Uh, you can also go to stitchpeople.com slash Michaels for all the patterns and supply lists if you missed any of the previous classes. And if you're interested, uh, we are running another holiday event through Stitch People starting on Saturday. We're going to be making a gingerbread pattern together. And it's going to be three Saturdays in a row where we're going to learn some embroidery techniques on a fun gingerbread pattern. So if this appealed to you, we're going to be doing more of it just like, oh, I'm like act acting like my above camera is still on. If this appealed to you and you want to learn more of it and learn some more techniques, go to stitchpeople.com slash jingle, as in like jingle all the way, uh, stitchpeople.com slash jingle and check it out. We're going to be working on a really cute, like colorful candy gingerbread house to learn embroidery techniques three Saturdays in a row starting on Saturday. And so we hope to see you there and we'll be able to connect that this is where you found us. And anyway, we just love to see you. So thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you in future Michael's classes and see you around the internet on uh, Facebook with Stitch People, on Instagram with Stitch People and everything in between. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.